Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. Uh, I'm Steve Aiken. I am the editor-at-large for Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And Steve, in a year that we have not had many red carpet events or concerts or award shows, I am pleased to say that we are going to be celebrating the unveiling of new plants for 2021. And that is the topic of today's episode. We, are, we're, we have plants walking down the red carpet, strutting their stuff. And it's the one event that hasn't been postponed. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know where you're going with that. I don't watch those shows anyway. So I'm not... <laughs> well, neither do I. But, you know, I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, hey, so many things this year have been postponed, canceled, put on hold, but new plants were not put on hold. Well, well, they, they almost were. Yeah, you were explaining yeah. to me yesterday about the, the industry's approach to new plants. Um, yeah, yeah, and can yeah. Can you explain that for the listeners? Well, so, you know, I've been working on a, on a feature that's going into fine gardening into our May-June issue. I had to look over here. <laughs> We're doing a new plant feature that we always do. And in talking to a lot of these companies and and plant breeders, that was the when the pandemic hit and, you know, plant production needed to rev up. So basically they pulled money from not knowing what was going to happen. A lot of these companies pulled money from their new plant production, which usually doesn't pay off for a couple of years when they get these new plants onto the market and then they start selling and instead they decided to take a lot of that money for new plant production and put it into producing more of plants that they already have on the market. So, um, so I was a little nervous going into this because there was not a huge, usually there is a huge amount of new plants that are released every single year. Um, but this year there was a, um, a, a smaller pool, I will say, smaller. You know, I, and I would have to say that I, I don't understand why the emphasis is on putting out new plants every year when it takes them a few years to trickle into the consciousness um, yeah. of the gardener. Mm-hmm. And hey, I love a new plant just as much as everybody else does. Uh, but but I will say, like even one of the ones on on, on my list today um was was introduced a couple years ago but like i just found out about it you know last spring oh you know, uh, i have one of those too yeah, yeah. and and, and uh, you know the, there's a couple of them i'm not exactly sure when they were released i know it's relatively new mm-hmm. uh, so you know like what what's why rush to get all these things out there a and b honestly a lot of them don't need to be released i mean do we really need <laughs> 10 10 new hibiscus is you know, when you released 15 last year, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, and, I, and, and I, I'm still I'm still looking for the one from last year. Now you have the improved version. Like, well, what, you know, yeah, why, yeah. why was I a sucker to be an early adopter on that one when you came up with it and released a new one? you know, the next year or something like that. So exactly, exactly. And I feel like that you see a lot more of that in the annuals. Um, oh, yeah than than any other category of plant. Um, you don't see it as much in veggies. You don't see it as much in perennials and shrubs. Um, I would say annuals then perennials is when you see that the most. But annuals, man, you know, the new, the improved, the this, scavola, and then you actually buy it and you like it. And then the next year, the new and improved blue wave, scavola, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Now it's been replaced by the new, new, improved, periwinkle scavola and that is so frustrating to me absolutely yeah. frustrating well and, and you know i i've had and, and i'm sure you've had you know plant marketers you know in, in discussion with us um and and i would say like well why uh, because you know i don't know better not to say this why fall in love with an annual they're just going to be a different one next year mm-hmm. and they they don't want to hear that because they're they're putting a lot of money behind those annuals to get those you know, marketed. And I don't know why, because there's going to be a new one next year, you know? Yeah. And so my, my approach with, with most of those mass market annuals is to, you just go and you buy what's at the nursery. You know? Yeah. And if yeah. there isn't one in your color, then you don't get it. You get something else, you know, um, but, you but know like what? why fall in love? Yeah. Or do, or do a better job marketing it? Because if it is 
a scavola that doesn't get thrips or is mildew resistant and yeah. a more compact habit? Hey, tell me that. Don't tell me that, oh, you know, it's the newest, the latest, the great. To actually tell me why this one is so much better than the last one. You know, I, I mean, just giving it a new name and it looks exactly the same as the last one isn't going to do it for me. I mean, I, ironically, the hardest thing to find out about these new plants is what makes them different from the old one. You know, and and you and I, because we we always go back, like you say, like these are these, and I'm like, well, what's different from the old one? What's it? And mm -hmm. it's it's hard to find out. Like, why do you not want to tell us how it's you know how it's better? And uh, sometimes the 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 improvement is to the breeder, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the seller and the grower. Yeah. Okay, that, that's fine. But let's let's let us know. Hey, it's just as this, but it's 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 easier for us to produce. You know. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if I see you know old and new, it doesn't matter which one I get because they're the same for me. But they're one's better for you. Yeah. Like, it, it would just be good to to know that. And yeah, like I went to um, there's a, a company that introduces a lot of plants, and I went to a presentation they had years ago, um, and they talked a lot about uh, some of these new plants, and I said. You know, I've been reading about these plants for months and you've never said any of this stuff. Like, had you told me this, I would have been all in on this plant, you know, yeah. but, but I didn't know it. Like why they don't, you know, I have yeah. no idea why they don't. I don't know. I mean, do we think different? I don't think we think any differently than, than a gardener would. I mean, our, uh, working well, for are, a magazine. We are, we are gardeners. So well, yeah. You know. I mean, working for a magazine doesn't mean that, oh, we want information that a gardener wouldn't want. I feel like we want the exact same information that the gardener wants. We want because we want to plant these things too. And we want to know what makes them different. Well, our, 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 our goal is to make it useful to the gardener. We like, we just don't want to, you know, be friends with the, with the plant company. We want to be useful to the gardener and the gardener wants to know, well, what's in it for me? You yeah. know, and so that's where like, well, why, why do I want this one as opposed to the other one? Yeah. Um, and, and the reason is usually there. You just usually have to dig for it. Yeah. Yeah. So well, should, we talk, should we talk about plants? Yeah, let's talk about plants. Why not? Right. Uh, do you want to go first? You want me to go I, first? I, I do want to go first because there's a plant that um, is, is technically on both of our lists. <laughs> um, yeah. Yesterday, uh, dear listeners, um, Danielle and I were in a meeting and I ran quickly over the, the, the plants I was going to talk about today. I said, yeah, I got one of these and one of those. And I got a colocasia on there. And she's like, well, it's not Pharaoh's mask, is it? I'm like, yes, it's Pharaoh's mask. And then, you know, there was there was there was glaring through the Zoom you know, meeting at each other. Um, and you were, you were kind enough to relent and let me have uh, talk about um, this plant. Uh, but it's Pharaoh's mask colocasia, uh, also known as elephant ears. Mm -hmm. Um and so this, it's, it's a tropical plant. I think it's already into zone seven, but oh, it definitely, okay. I, I, that's what the, you know, the online stuff said. Okay. Uh, and uh, all, all the way down to probably zone 10 or 11. I mean, like I said, they're, they're tropical. They come from, you know, what, uh, Southeast Asian rainforests and things like that. Um, and so, so Colocasia um, the, is grown for their leaves and their leaves are, are, if you imagine a heart shape, you know, and then you pull down on the bottom point and get <laughs> no. to get this elongated shape. That's what a colocasia leaf looks like. And these leaves get to be like 10, 12 inches long. Um, so they're really dramatic and in your face and they're held on these long stems that, that are that go up and out. So they're really just like showing them to you and they're kind of like dancing, you know, in, in the breeze and they, they, they're always looking at you. Um, which is awesome. And so this one, um, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, um, but it's, it's, it's got this shiny, I would say Hulk green leaves. Uh, that's, that's my, uh, how I interpret this, this green, they're, they're shiny. Um, and then it has these, these deep purple veins to it, like very prominent, very thick veins in it. And, and they actually stick out, they pop out, uh, from mm -hmm. the, the surface of the leaf. So like, it's, it's like a, a relief or it's like, it's like it's embossed, uh, yeah, I, I guess yeah. is, is the word um, to it. And it's, it's, it's immediately it's striking. It's, it's freaky cool. And I'm not into like freaky plants. Like some people grow plants just because they're freaky. Yeah. This is, this is freaky, but in a cool way. Uh, and yeah. I, and I, I saw this months ago, um, actually on Instagram and I, I did a screenshot of it and I've, I've been waiting, I've been waiting to put it in the magazine, you know, until it was seasonally appropriate. Yeah. Um, and so, so it's coming up uh, actually in the same issue as the, as the new plants. So you can't have it for that either. Um, 
Thanks but for it's, the it's, warning. It's, it's going to be our up and comer. Uh, but that's Pharaoh's mask, uh, Colocasia. So sun to part shade. Um, the size is said to be four feet tall by three to four feet wide, which I think if it were in the ground okay. in a very warm spot, it would be. I grow them in containers because they're not they're not hardy for me. They're easy enough to over. They're super easy to overwinter. Mm-hmm. Basically, just bring them inside. Um, I I am under the impression that Colocasia is like wet soil. And I have grown them in standing water. But mm-hmm. in reading the advice from the plant company on this, it said average soil and make sure their feet don't get too wet. And I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, I think um, that the bulb like sometimes can rot. I've actually had that happen just because I've only ever grown them in containers. And on the rare occasion that I have them, I usually have them right outside my front door. So it's the one container that I'm really good at watering. Cool. The only container I'm good at watering. And uh, several years ago, not this, not Pharaoh's mask, but uh, I had one rot on me. Um, And I think it was purely from overwater and it was in a container that didn't have a drainage hole. So I I think I screwed that up. So that, that, that rings true to me in in, in that. Yeah. So I'm going to have to um, be a little more careful with my colocasias. Mm. Um, It was just that one year that I grew them. Uh, in in standing water, like I had a water container, and and they look great. But I love colocasias for that for that bold presence, um, and I, and I really like them emerging, you know, with those thick stems uh, emerging from some low ornamental grasses, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. because it, it's a, it's a good contrast. They're both like up up and out, but one's thick and the other one's thin. Uh, you kind of like a dwarf penicetum or something like that. I think they yeah. look really cool, um, but it's it's tough because it, you know, like I said. A colocasia, even if it doesn't want standing water, definitely likes a lot of water. Yeah. Uh, and and oh, most yeah. ornamental grasses do not. Um, so that can be kind of tough. And so I've done that with with two different pots, like growing yeah. the, you know, and, you know, putting them in a way so it looks like they're, um, they're, they're planted in the same thing. Um, but I'm trying to think of something that I can plant that's going to emphasize those bold, you know, purple veins to really bring out the purple. Mm. And I think like a really pale grass, like a, a blonde ambition, uh, but mm-hmm. something that gets tan. So it almost acts as a gold to that purple. Purple and gold is a great color combination. Cool. And so it's, it, you know, uh, so I'm thinking that I don't know if it would actually work. You know, oh, I was that. I was thinking like, what about um, strobilanthes, like Persian shield? So you're picking up on that. You're picking purple, up on the purple. Yeah. So you kind of, you know, you kind of get because because that that whole green is a little dark and the purple like you can see that purple veining. But I feel like I would almost want to like do it maybe a, a, you know, a color echo of that purple veining and do like strobilanthes next to it, which is another bold plant. Um, but yeah, I. I, yeah, I was bummed that you took this plant, but you did a great job describing it because it really was something that I just, I saw it. it I saw it come in as a new plant and, and it was, I think maybe a press release for me. And I just thought, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's on my list. That's on my yeah. list. <laughs> um, so this, this was, yours was a brand new release. 2021 was the first time that I had ever seen that mentioned whatsoever. Um, but I'm going to throw it back to a plant that was released in July, August of 2020, which I hadn't heard about until I went digging <clears throat> for some new plant material or new plant content. And um, this is from our friend, Brett Horvath um, out in Intrinsic Perennial Gardens, and he's out in the Midwest, um, out in Illinois. And it's Polished Brass Joe Pie Weed. Have you ever heard of this plant? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I was going to be so bummed if you were like, yeah, Danielle, everybody knows about that plant. Well, but- no, like, like I, I, I might have heard of it because I was trolling the Intrinsic website <laughs> looking for plants too. Um, so, so it, it's a bit confusing because, you know, everybody's making the conversion from you, uh, eupatorium to you, you, tro- you, trochium, you, trochium, you, trochium. Yeah. So everybody's making that transition and actually on Brent's website, you, it's still listed as eupatorium, but regardless, it's polished brass Joe pieweed. So this is a native plant. Um, it's very, very cool because the one thing that I think bums me out about Joe Pieweeds is that for most 
of the spring and into the summer before they start blooming in late summer, early fall, is that they're just a green plant. You know, they kind of fall into that solidago category, you know, goldenrod or asters where they don't look like much until they put on the show in the late season, which there's nothing wrong with that. But this one has this bronzy brass purple all over the leaves. And it maintains that color through spring, it comes up with that color. It's more pronounced in spring and maintains that that darker purpley color all the way into summer before it then eventually fades to mostly green. But that's right when it starts blooming, which is really awesome. And this guy blooms with their white flowers, but their individual little puffball white flowers, and it gets completely covered. So we'll put some pictures up on the, the YouTube recording of this podcast that or you could go to our website to see these pictures too, that it looks like a cloud of cotton balls. It is so cool. It is so eye-catching. And the neat thing is, is that it's four foot tall and four foot wide. This guy is massive, totally massive. Are you laughing at my my mound of cotton balls? <laughs> For some reason, it made me think of a toilet paper commercial. This, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a Cottonelle commercial, but so much cooler. Um, and the neat thing about this is, is we'll also put this up. So, so I, I asked Brent, I said, Hey, still a pollinator magnet. And he said, Oh yeah, let me send you a video. So he sent a video of this plant completely covered in pollinators. Just go into town. It looks like this plant is you know, alive, you know, it's going to get up and crawl away because it's got so many pollinators on it. So I think I mentioned that it was four foot tall and four foot wide. This is not a shrinking violet, polished brass, Joe Pieweed, zones three to eight. So it's got a pretty wide range as well. Um, And Joe Pieweed tends to like moisture soil, full sun, but consistent moisture. You'll see it in its native environment. Generally, it's along stream beds or, you know, in a, in a swale area. Um, so it is going to need some, some water, some supplemental water if you put it in a dry bed. But gosh, yeah, I, I was just, I love it when you take a plant, you know, I think we talked about Cali Carpa is a perfect example that they've now come out with some purple variegation on the leaves of, of Beautyberry Cali Carpa. And that's what that plant needed. It needs some interest in those months where it just looks like a green blob. And it's the same with this polished brass Joe Pieweed. Love yeah. it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not surprised that you you would like a plant like this because it reminds me of the New York Giants uh, in, in which, you know, in their in their good years, they kind of are mediocre throughout all the year. Then toward when the playoffs come, all of a sudden they become a great team and win the Super Bowl. <laughs> You know, like they were nothing for for the first, you know, 13 weeks of the season. Then the last three in the playoffs, suddenly they're, you know, they can't be beat. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of what it reminds me of. Okay. But uh, I, I've, I've shied away from Joe Pieweeds just because of that, that moist soil mm. requirement. Um, but you know, we've grown some down at the test garden and I haven't given them any extra water. Yeah. Uh, and they've done okay. But they, they do, they do suffer from, from, from what you said, just being like a green plant. Yeah. You know, I, I go down there in, in, in May, you know, in early June and I'm like, what the heck is that? You know, is that a weed? Yeah. Like, oh, I, I better let that go. And then a few weeks go by, I'm like, oh, right. It's Joe Pye weed. Cause you can see that as like a rough texture and like, oh, that's Joe Pye. I better let, let it go. Yeah. And then, you know, come come August, you know, September, I'm like, oh, yeah, Joe Pye, way to go. You know, <laughs> I am so smart for not pulling you out, you know. Uh, yeah. I love it. All right, Steve. So if I pick a New York Giants, who are you picking next? <laughs> oh, geez. Um, well, I, I guess this would be um, this would be the team that looks really good in, in, in the football preseason, which is which is summer. Okay. Yes. You know, so so all summer long, everyone's like, "Oh, this is going to be the plant to be. This is going to be the plant to be," uh, because it's called all summer joy geranium, um, oh. and that's a stretch. That's a that's a stretch. And I only okay. came up with that analogy because you asked. Um, but uh, all summer joy geranium, which is which is a true geranium, not the Pelargonium, you know, annuals that we know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, all summer joy is the common name. The Latin name would be geranium all summer joy. Uh, <laughs> hey, I. You know what? No, I like that. 
Make Can it simple. Should? Stick to it. Don't give me this cult of our name. That's eight Z eight nine hundred forty two thousand PF. Give me the same name. Yeah, yeah. I got one of those coming up. But um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, give me the same name. But it's it, it. You know, as you and I being um, magazine editors, it reads funny. All summer yeah. joy, ger- geranium, geranium. All summer joy. You know. <laughs> Uh, but zones three to nine. So that has an even better hardy hardiness mm-hmm. uh, range than than your Joe Pie weed. Mm-hmm. Um, full sun. Um, and this is this is uh, touted as being an improvement over Roseanne. OK, which pre- pretty much every geranium released since Roseanne has said it's been an improvement over Roseanne. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one, this one for me has has a little promise to it, because the thing I didn't like about Roseanne um, was that its its habit was kind of scraggly. It was kind of very yeah. loose, you know? And so I planted a, a huge mass of it in my yard and it just looked like a scraggly mess, you know? And mm-hmm. um, it always looked great in other people's yards because they had it planted with other things. Yeah. Um, but I did, I, I did not. I basically had it, you know, as a mass. And yeah, it bloomed all the time and, and was tough. And I think I still have some uh, because I had to move it, you know, like little tufts of of, uh, of root would would, would resprout. Um, so so tough plant, but just I didn't like the habit. And so what All Summer Joy um, supposedly has as as an improvement is a tighter habit, which I, th- I think a few other geraniums have said that they have had that too. Um, but but this one is 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 I don't know. It's striking. The the um, the flowers are are like that pale. I don't know what is a lavender pinkish purple kind of thing. And then they have like these little deep purple or veins uh, on them. So they look, they look pretty cool. Um, it's a manageable size, like, you know, just over a foot tall, like to 18 inches tall um, and maybe two feet wide. So that's, okay. that's going to form a nice perennial mm-hmm. clump. Um, and, and if it's going to hold that shape, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all, and then bloom all summer, you know, and last mm-hmm. more than more than two or three years in my garden. Um, that's going to be a total winner. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about all summer joy geranium. That I'm excited about that too, because I, I want a sprawling geranium ish sprawling, you know, not a super compact Biacova, you know, you know, in that Carmina range. I don't, I, I like that. I have that. But I want I want a better behaved Roseanne because my Roseanne geranium got big, got very, very poofy, started to kind of sprawl out. And then by usually July or August, it was so sprawly that it was burning out in the center and the foliage was dying underneath it. It, it was just ugly. And I even planted it near a, 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 a Dobbs frosted juniper so i planted it where it could go and you know kind of mingle around but the only part of the plant that really looked good was the flowers the rest of it really wilted out and 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 burned out and i had it in full sun and then i thought oh god should i have had it in part shade what what's going on and eventually i just ripped it out it just was not ever what i wanted it to be i wanted it but i wanted it with a better habit so all summer joy sounds cool to me did you say, oh, three to nine, you said, right? Three to nine. Yeah. And okay. like, you know, like if, if it's, if it's as tough, like I find all geraniums to be pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, th- these are, these are tough plants. So a, a tough flowering powerhouse for full sun. Um, yeah. I, I will give it a shot. I'll absolutely give it a shot. Um, nice. I mean, cause who, who doesn't need that? So, I mean, that's um, low risk, high reward kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I like it. I picked my next plant because I thought it had a fun name. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, full disclosure, that's why I picked it. Now, well, you know, I I have a I have a a decent sized vegetable garden. I wouldn't say it's big or little. You know, it's a decent sized vegetable garden. And for years and years and years, I've tried to grow pumpkins. And the most successful pumpkins I've ever grown have actually just been uh, in the compost pile from rotten jack-o'-lanterns from the previous year. That's been my, that's been my success story with pumpkins. So I want to go out and grow this pumpkin this year. It's called Igor. Um, I 
G O R, and you would think, oh, that's Igor. Nope. They they specifically at Johnny's selected seed said it is pronounced Igor. So you know you kind of get that little Halloween flair. You know I love Halloween. But the cool thing about this pumpkin, it was uh, part of a really, I guess, many, many year long breeding program at Johnny's. They, they say that it's it's got pronounced shoulders with a really super strong stem. And with pumpkins, a lot of times what ends up happening is that the stem basically dies off and start, start, stops feeding the pumpkin. So you kind of end up with an undersized pumpkin that you then have to, you know, cut off the vine completely and let ripen. And it's just, it's never the pumpkins that you see at the garden centers and at the nurseries to buy. Um, This one also is an elongated pumpkin. I like, instead, you know, I guess you're, you know, you're one kind of person, you either like the short fat pumpkins or the tall and skinny ones. This is a tall, skinny pumpkin. Really, 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 you know, a pronounced rib to it. So it's this classic, cool looking pumpkin. But again, it's just this, you know, uniform size that it says it will actually get to because it's got that strong stem union on the plant. So that was that was really enticing to me to maybe give it a try again. I'm 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 confused. What does it look like? It just is it round? It is no, it's a tall, skinny pumpkin. About tall, skinny. T- about twenty-five to thirty-five pounds, so it's sizable, but right. it's in you know, it's kind of more oblong shaped, tall and skinny. It's got really, really deep ribs to it. So you've got those, you know, those really, really interesting kind of channels all the way through it. It's got, you know, kind of a a, a bigger bottom to it, so it will stand upright. But the biggest thing is with with the pumpkin is that it supposedly has this improved stem union. So you're not well. That's 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 like what we were talking about earlier. Like, who cares about the stem stem union? Like, what, 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 <laughs> no, no. What, no, what does that mean for me? No, you know? that's important because that means that it will stay on the vine long enough to be able to actually reach its size potential and reach its ripeness uh, potential without you having to and be like oh so many pumpkins well basically it i you know damping off isn't the right word but the the stem union separates so it won't grow to its potential the pumpkin won't ever reach you know classic okay. pumpkin style so, right. this so, so one, that's, that's, that's not a look thing but it's, no. it's, more, it's, a, it's a performance thing it's a, so, it's a totally performance so you, thing. you said it had strong shoulders so i was imagining it having like a hunchback kind of thing that's why they it, called it igor igor yeah, yeah it's got a little it's got those strong shoulders and then it kind of elongates out and then you get like a little bump at the bottom that it holds up. So it's very uniquely shaped. We'll put a photo up online, but it is pretty cool looking. And all right, first of all, yes, I I was like, Igor, that's amazing. And then I read about it and thought, oh, actually it backs up the coolness and, you know, it's better performance with that stem union that it, that has that strong handle um, they call they call the stem on the pumpkin the the handle, so it's got that strong stem union. So, will you use this for a jack o' lantern? I think so. Yeah, or I you, think you, so. You have, you have to put some Marty Feldman eyes on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's see if I can actually get this thing to grow outside of my compost pile, and then 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 I will do that. I'll take a picture for you. <laughs> Hey, Steve, do you have any edibles on your uh, list? I actually do. Um, I have a fig tree, a dwarf fig tree. Oh. Its name is uh, Little Miss Figgy. <gasps> you picked it because of the name. Well, I picked it because of the name and because it's <laughs> dwarf um, so that I could grow it in a container and bring it in because uh, figs, fig trees are barely hardy in zone six. And usually um to overwinter them like people say oh yeah sure you can overwinter them and then they go through these elaborate schemes of like bending them over and burying them and yeah. building these things i'm like that's too much for me this is a dwarf um fig that i can keep in a pot and do keep in a pot it's actually right behind me right now um and, and then bring in and, and bring out um uh, and because that, that's all i'm willing to do uh, for a fig um, my wife likes figs, so if I can actually get some edible figs off of this, then then I'm a hero. Um, Little Miss Figgy Fig, uh, Ficus uh, Carica, and then it has a cultivar name, which is Majoam, M-A-J-O-A-M. Uh, okay. 
We'll assume that was the breeder. <laughs> Little Miss Figgy is, is a great name. You know, right. figs have just these very cool leaves. They're heavily lobed leaves, like like an oak, but cooler, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so, like, if, if you think of an oak as an East Coast person, then you go to their mellow, super cool, laid back West Coast thing with more lobes, deeply cut lobes. That's a fig tree. That's what a fig. And, and it's got a very cool, shiny green um, foliage. Like I said, this one um, is dwarf, supposedly to get to four to eight feet tall, three to four feet wide. But I'm growing in a pot. So I, yeah. cut that, I, I imagine that cut that in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's supposed to bear fruit in spring and fall. Uh, but right, well, right now it is, it is, uh, it's January and mine is covered in fruit. Um, yeah. I want you to go and get it. I want to see it. We, we videotape now. I can't believe that you don't have her like right by you to like hold her up to the camera. Well, it's right there. All Uh, right. Okay. Let's let's let, let's let her be. Um, (laughs) and so this is, this is, I mean, so for all those great qualities, also tough. Because, like I said, growing it in a container, mm-hmm. I got it early in the spring. It's from the Southern Living Plants Collection. So they sent it to me early, you know, mm-hmm. not knowing that Connecticut, like, it's too early for me to deal with this plant. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had it in a pot. All my all my containers are on drip irrigation, except this one. And I mm-hmm. uttered the faithful words, like, oh, I'll remember to water it. Um, I, I did not. I watered it with great infrequency. Uh, and we had a very, 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 very dry summer. We had a mm-hmm. drought summer. Um, and at some point this plant gave up and lost all its leaves and I'm like, oh, well, that's it. Um, and I don't know what happened. Uh, the rains didn't really return in fall, but something happened and it leafed out again. And I said, oh, little Miss Figgy, I'll never do that to you again. And I've been taking care of her ever since, you know, and by, by taking care of her, I mean, just like watering, you know, like, oh, geez, I can't remember the last time I watered, I'll water. Yeah. Um, and she's been doing great. Like she leafed out again and I was just growing her for, for her leaves. And then all of a sudden, boom, she, she put on a whole bunch. I think there's like seven or eight you know, um, fruits on this thing. And it's maybe just over a foot tall. Um, I don't know when they're going to ripen or what they're going to taste like or anything like that, but it's, it's just super cool. It's been out since, since 2017, I think. So not a new plant. It's widely available. A little Miss Figgy fig. Do you know if it's going to be a purple or a green fig? I think it's supposed to ripen to purple. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome because you know that's in my in my humble opinion that is a far superior tasting fig is the purple figs. Um which I know I I know zero about, but those are delicious. Um yeah, green figs can be a little a bit more on the tart side. So that is so cute. I love it. How come I didn't get one? I don't know. <laughs> Southern living plants. All right. Well, um, ironically, I'm going to do a, a small dwarf fruit as well. Um, and I'm going to go with Midnight Cascade Blueberry. So that's a vaccinium. FC12-187. <laughs> so anyway, Midnight Cascade trademarked uh, blueberry. And this is a weeping blueberry, a dwarf weeping blueberry, 18 to 24 inches tall and wide, full sun. Berry size is medium, basically a standard size blueberry. So not if you're thinking, you know, of all these dwarf blueberries that have come out recently, like jelly bean that have a teeny tiny berry, more like a, um, like a main blueberry. Nope. This is a high bush blueberry size blueberry. Um, the company that released it is touting it as a hanging basket alternative to growing the blueberry in hanging baskets. And I was super skeptical thinking, why on earth would you want to do that? And then I saw it as a hanging basket plant and it's beautiful. Blueberries are just beautiful looking plants anyway. They have these really, really beautiful glossy green leaves that have a tinge of red to them um, in fall. They come out a little, this variety comes out when in spring, the leaves, the foliage is a little glaucousy blue to it. Um, yeah, just really cool. And you, it has a decent harvest. Um, they say that you'll get you uh, a couple of pints of blueberries off each plant. And I thought, huh, That's really cool. Now, I'm not a hanging basket person, so that's not my deal. But I'm thinking in other containers, 
this could look really cool as, you know, your spiller over the edge. Um, you know, you'd have to have a, a decent sized container to do that. But I, I'm i intrigued. I will say I'm very intrigued. Or I was thinking the alternative to that is I have a lot of, you know, hardscaping, a lot of stone walls and such. And how cool would it be to have a cascading blueberry over the edges of my stone walls? Um, I just, I love that plant. We talk about high bush blueberry um, maxinium being a really interesting ornamental plant that also happens to produce fruit. And this gives blueberry another area in the garden that it could be as a cascading, almost ground cover type of deal. Yeah, you know, you, you, you had me at um, cascading and then you lost mm-hmm. me with hanging basket because I'm not a hanging <laughs> basket person either. But then I started thinking of, of, of a long, or like a tall, narrow pot mm-hmm. and having it at that. You know, so it's almost like yeah. a focal point you know, at that. And I'm like, oh, well, that could be interesting. Um, and and now I want one. Right. So so this is so they have two. Um, Midnight Cascade was the one that I just chose because I, I just liked the look of it better and it had a larger fruit. There is a variety that's also been released called Sapphire Cascade, a, a little bit smaller fruit to it. Um, I don't know the difference. I haven't grown them side by side, so I'm not sure. And just know that it's zones five to nine. So that's, that's where you're, what you're dealing with there. Okay. So in keeping with the dwarf plant, um, my last plant is also a dwarf. It's actually a dwarf of a dwarf. Um, Okay. So um, I didn't want to recommend this plant, but for some reason, my mind kept going back to it. So I thought there was something there. Um, okay. Like a lot of people, I love lilacs. Um, mm. In spring, you cannot beat their fragrance and their wonderful flowers. Um, so I, I love them for that reason. I don't love their suckering and their powdery mildew and the fact that they're great in spring, but then sit there for the other three seasons, you know. True. Uh, for, yeah, the other three seasons. Um, so... I, I really don't have any lilacs in my yard, although, oh gosh, I wish. And so when I see something like uh, like Miss Kim uh, lilac, mm-hmm. uh, and there's another dwarf one out there, I, I'm Tinker very – Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell. Um, anyway, there, there are some dwarf ones out there, but they're still pretty big. They're like four to five feet tall, you know, um, and I just haven't been able to to bite the bullet, you know. Uh, on those, um, but they now have a dwarf version of uh, of uh, of Miss Kim, and it's called Baby Kim, Baby Kim Lilac, uh, Syringa. Cultivar name is Sminstistu. <laughs> That's S M N S D T P. Apparently, uh, all the vowels are on strike that day. Um, zones three to eight, and it's 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 a it's a lilac, so. You get the wonderful purple spring fragrant flowers, but it's only three feet tall and wide. Hmm. And it has this 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 nice um, rounded habit to it. You know, full sun, uh, of course, well-drained soil. Um, and so what I'm thinking is at, at three feet tall and wide, that's not a lot of room for me to give up for something that is of limited, you know, it, it, ha- it has great spring, you know, upside but then not so much for the rest, but it's this, it's this rounded habit. It, I find it hard to find good shrubs, good small shrubs with a rounded habit. Yeah. Two to and three so feet tall and wide. Very difficult. Yeah. So, so if I'm getting that rounded habit, I'm getting something out of it for at least two more seasons, you know, because I can, I can play off of that shape, you know, mm-hmm. that rounded shape. I can, I can use it to, uh, to, to highlight something that's a little more, you know, fountain shaped or, or, or you know, firework shaped. Um, I can I can use that. So it does have, though it doesn't have flowers or anything really interesting to look at, it can still factor into my design, you mm-hmm. know, and I can make use out of it. Whereas I couldn't really with, you know, with one of the tall gangly ones sending up suckers everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I, I'm in on this one. I want, you know, a, a baby Kim lilac. If I'm going to get those spring flowers and a nice mounding shrub that that I can use in my design, um, I'm cool. that that to me overcomes the downside of a lilac. 
Yeah. Now, okay, so talk to me, and you may not know the answer to this, but talk to me about flowers, because the one thing with Tinkerbell and Miss Kim was that it wasn't really the classic lilac flower shape. It wasn't like those con- like those, uh, like those conical type ice cream cone shaped flowers. They were more a little bit looser with tinier little blooms, but like more prolific all around the shrub. Um, do you know the flower shape on, on baby Kim? They, they looked more like, um, like the flower clusters were like round balls as opposed to like, I, I think of a lilac as having like a long, like flower cluster. Like yeah. you know, it's a, th- these were more rounded and the individual flowers were like, were like little tubes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep, deep, oh. deep, like, like a wonderful purple, which supposedly holds throughout the season. And like the, the end where it flares out is, is white. It's like, I think okay. the inside is white. Okay. Um, but, but that's just, I, I've just seen a few pictures of it. That, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all I know about it. Um, but they look good. And to me, the most important thing about the, the lilac flower isn't so much, what it looks like, but what it smells like. Yeah, true, true, you know, true, true. Like I, I want that lilac fragrance. So, you know, I, I, I don't care if those those flowers look like you know, uh, uh, Igor pumpkin. It, it, <laughs> as, long as, they, as long as they smell the way that 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 they do, like that's what yeah. I really want in, in that flower. Exactly. Okay, so we're we we didn't plan this out. Uh, let's just say that from the top. But I'm ending on the opposite of a dwarf that they upsized (laughs) to a larger plant. So, all right. My love for limelight hydrangea, panicle hydrangea, hydrangea paniculata limelight. It has been around for many, many, many years. Um, Was released as being a margarita green, chartreuse green blossom that eventually matures to white and then gets a pink blush in fall. It's a giant. I mean, we're talking eight feet tall and eight feet wide. It's enormous. I have one. I love it. It's great. Guess what? It doesn't really stay green all that long. It's green when it's just budded and then basically it goes straight to white again. So for maybe five days, I get green blossoms on this panicle hydrangea. So then they downsized it to little lime panicle hydrangea, which was the dwarf, which I believe was maybe three feet tall and wide. And that one held its green longer, which was cool. It actually had a green blossom, which was really what I wanted because, you know, I love margaritas, but I just really like that color too. It's very subtle. So little lime. And that was released a couple years ago. Hydrangea paniculata, three feet tall and wide. But what I really want is something in between those that holds that green color as long as possible. So they took little lime and they upsized it a little bit. So now we have Limelight Prime Hydrangea Paniculata. And it, when this first came out or, or came across my desk, I thought, oh man, are you kidding me? How much longer can you guys ride this limelight train? But apparently it's claim to fame it is four to five feet tall and wide. So you got a nice medium. And an even a longer time that those green blossoms stay green. And allegedly, they stay green right up until the point that they start in fall blushing pink. Those puffy, long, kind of conical-shaped blossoms will go green and then blush into pink, which to me just makes me happy. It's it's everything I wanted, you know? It's what I wanted in Limelight, but Limelight is a beast and I have zero room for another Limelight, eight feet tall and wide. And I want something a little bigger than the little Limelight, but I want that color. So here we go. Um, I'm excited to try it. It's zones three to eight. Um, it's a rare example of they keep improving upon an improvement upon an improvement that I'm actually stoked about and excited to try. And you know how I feel about hydrangea paniculata. I have so many in my garden and, and uh, you know, some of them were sent as samples. Some of them I bought on my own. I, I just, that is a staple plant of all different sizes, colors, shapes all throughout my gardens. And uh, I'm going to find room to, to squeeze one more, um, and that's Limelight Prime. Uh, I should probably say the cult of our name, 
No, I shouldn't. It's a bunch of letters. Don't worry about it. It's Limelight Prime. <laughs> and it's an awesome hydrangea paniculata to, uh, to, to try. And I'm excited to try it. So there you go. Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> No, no, it, it sounds great. I think they should have done something Goldilocks related with um with the name. Because you had one that's too <laughs> tall, one that's too small, and this one is just right. Just uh, right. right in the middle. Yeah. No, I think I think that's great that they have like here's this here's the same plant. You can get it in tall, medium, or short. Like I, that, yep. that's perfect. Um there have been so many times like I love this plant. It's not tall enough, or it's mm-hmm. you know, uh, or it's too tall. Like yeah. whatever so i mean this, this sounds great and then it's holding that green color because that was my my issue with limelight too it was like um you know it, you you blink and you miss the the green it not quite but um it, it didn't last long enough yeah, uh, no. so no this, this that sounds like a, a a great shrub um and if you're digging up any of your original limelights to make room for this i know where they will find a good home <laughs> And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about new plants. With very few exceptions, the more I hear someone talk as though they know everything about plants, the less inclined I am to believe them. This is because the people I am positive know a lot about plants often say, I don't know. Consider the famous quote from the plant expert's expert, Tony Avent. You don't really know a plant until you have killed it three times. Hmm. One must grow a plant in a variety of situations to truly understand its strengths and its limitations. And those with plant knowledge will understand that, even then, that plant might behave differently in a garden on the other side of town. This is why I love new plants. No one really knows any more than anyone else about how these plants will grow. The breeder offers a good sense of how things should go, but they don't know how a plant will perform when Danielle plants it on her dry hillside or when Steve gives it too much shade and almost no water. The only way to know a new plant is to try it, and then you'll gain the most important type of knowledge, first-hand experience. And it will be experience on the most important topic, how the plant performs in your garden. Well, if you have to kill a plant three times to get to really know it, I must really know an awful lot of plants. (laughs) I can't wait to order new plants and lots of them so I can kill them at least three times. (laughs) Well, listen, Steve, I'm taking a look here. We're running a little long on this episode. So we are, we're going to do one better than the expert testimony. We're going to wrap things up early, but tell listeners to head to finegardening.com because we just recently published a webinar from Richard Hockey of the Chicago Botanic Garden, where he has a recording up there featuring 20, almost 20 new plants that he thinks are worth trying. And uh, so I feel like that's that's the best way we can do an expert testimony for this episode. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the best. It's a new plant. And then you have somebody really knowledgeable who's actually grown it and is not involved in the marketing or sales of the plant whatsoever and can tell you exactly what happened with this plant. That's awesome. Right. And and we've both listened to this webinar now and and watched the video of the webinar so you'll get to see what the plants look like. And you were just telling me that you literally have already ordered some of the plants that Richard talked about. (laughs) So so it's it's a free webinar, but it will cost you money. Yeah. (laughs) So go to finegardening.com. I know it sounds like a promo, but it really isn't. Go to finegardening.com. Go to the webinar page and look up New Plants Showing Promise by Richard Hockey to fill in the expert testimony for this episode. And uh, we'll see you next time.